Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I want to take a few minutes to talk about the battle rifles of World War II. There were essentially three that defined rifle combat in terms of full-power semi-automatic rifles for the Second World War, and those are the German Gewehr 43, the Soviet SVT-40, and the American M1 Garand. Now I've got these here ranked a bit. Uh, they are ranked in terms of production. So the Germans would manage to produce almost 600,000 semi-automatic battle rifles. Most of those, about 460,000, are Gewehr 43s. The remainder were Gewehr 41s, split between Mauser and Walther designs. Same designation, 41, but two different actual rifle designs made by different companies. Uh, this is not counting Sturmgewehrs that the Germans made later in the war. Those are small caliber, those are more of the intermediate caliber assault rifle pattern that we'll recognize after World War II mostly. Um, and today I just want to talk about the full-power battle rifles. So this is 8mm Mauser. The Soviets uh, had their SVT-38 and SVT-40, which are mechanically the same gun, just with some changes basically to the furniture and a few other smallish details. Those are of course chambered in 7.62 by 54 rimmed, and the Soviet Union would produce about 2.5 million of those rifles together, also including AVT-40s, which is the full-auto variation. Then we have the United States with the M1 Garand, again full-power cartridge, 30-06 caliber, and the US would produce right about 4 million M1s throughout the course of World War II. Now, to assess the pros and cons and understand these rifles' places in the war, I think the first thing we ought to do is look at how each country actually thought of a semi-automatic rifle. Did they want one? Why did they want one? What was the motivation going on? So to begin with the United States, the US had a relatively small army before World War II. Uh, the US has always been a technologically focused country. Um, as I mean, starting from fairly early on, they're always looking at ways to increase the efficiency of manpower. We have a huge territorial geography relative to the number of people in the country, and so labor-saving mechanical devices have always been something of great interest in the United States. That's driven a lot of industry, and that is reflected in the military view of a semi-automatic rifle, which is largely, it's a great way to increase the combat efficiency of every individual soldier. We don't have a ton of guys. If we give everybody a self-loading rifle, like, we can basically it will allow our soldiers to punch above their weight class. So the M1 design begins essentially in 1919 at the very earliest uh, with John Cantius Garand, a Canadian immigrant. How appropriately American that our battle rifle is designed by an immigrant uh, who starts working on it. He eventually goes to work for the Springfield Armory and spends the 1920s and 1930s refining and developing this design. It's formally adopted in 1936. Almost. Well, it is adopted, but it's adopted in the form that we know today as the gas trap, which is a slightly different configuration of the gas system at the muzzle. Those guns go into production and they've got a few tens of thousands made by the time they decide that this gas trap system isn't quite ideal and we really ought to change it up. They refine the design, give it the this gas system, the front end that we're used to today, and that's it. That's the standard rifle. Uh, one of the big advantages, I think, for the United States with rifle production during World War II is that there are basically no variations to the M1. We get the design done, set it kind of in stone, and just build literally four million of the things. Now, the arsenals, the factories, were indeed experimenting with odd variations, paratrooper rifles, magazine feeds, muzzle devices, all sorts of stuff, but none of that actually got adopted into military service, with the slight exception of the M1C sniper pattern. But even those are relatively, I mean, they're really quite low production. They barely see service during the war. And there's no, like, there aren't variations on the M1. The M1 that you would have gotten issued in the spring of 1942 is essentially the same M1 that you would have gotten issued in the summer of 1945. Really, the differences, because of course there are going to be changes made, but for the US, for the M1, their machine, their mechanical uh, or uh, manufacturing tweaks. How do we change the, slightly change the profile on this part so that it takes three minutes less on the machine tools so that we can produce this gun faster and more efficiently? Those are the changes that are primarily made to the M1. Now the Soviet Union is fairly similar. Um, they also come into the 1920s 
thinking that a semi-automatic rifle would be really great, and wanting to equip the army with semi-automatic rifles. Now, their development process is a bit different from the United States, where this rifle is largely adopted in its almost final form. The Soviet Union has a process by which they adopt rifles, where there's a lot more of, we'll adopt this, we'll build a few hundred or a few thousand of them, send them to troops, and have a sort of a synergistic collaboration between the factory and the troops and the design bureau to refine and improve the design. So a rifle adopted into the Soviet uh, service is generally not going to be as perfected as one that the US is, develop is adopting at that point in the war. And that's why we see the SVT-38 and the SVT-40. And before them we see a series of other rifles, the best known being the AV, uh, AVS-36, which AVS-36 you could sort of equate to the M1 in 276 caliber, where it was a developmental stage, it was tested by the military, but it was not put into production. Like There were the small number of prototypes made for formal testing, they decided that's not how they wanted to go, continued refining the design, changed the caliber to 30 6 In the Soviet Union the way that process would sort of mirror is that that Pedersen caliber M1 would have been adopted into service, they would have made a couple thousand of them, done field trials, decided if it was what they wanted, and if it was they keep working on it and start making them in larger numbers, and if it's not they make changes and go back and kind of start the process over. So I think it, it's fairly accurate to think of the SVT-38 as really the equivalent of the gas trap M1. The numbers manufactured are relatively similar between the two, and the time frames are actually relatively similar. The M1 is adopted in 1936, it's actually not until early 43 that the entire US Marine Corps, who is the last branch to get the M1, they don't, they're not 100% equipped with M1s till 43. So the US didn't quite go into the war already having an M1 in every soldier's hand. The Soviet Union definitely didn't go into the war with every soldier having an SVT. But they're making, if you compare the timelines, the, the SVT 38's being made in about the same numbers at about the same time as the gas trap M1. And so they realize there's some tweaks we want to make to this SVT, the result is the SVT-40. Major production on the SVT-40 takes place in 1941, and that's the period where there is this hope of this will be our new standard rifle. It will also be our new sniper rifle. The sniper pattern of the SVT is primarily produced in 1940 and 1941. The difference that we run into here is the Soviet Union does not continue along that path, where the US locks into the M1 and just stays with it and is manufacturing them in massive numbers by the end of the war, the Soviet Union adopts the SVT and then decides to go in a different direction. For a couple of reasons. First off, the sniper pattern turns out to be pretty much a failure. Um, it is Not that it doesn't work, but it doesn't work well enough for them. Uh, to the extent that it's put out of production, it's replaced by developing the PU pattern of Mosin 9130 as a replacement sniper rifle. Uh, the US doesn't do that. We don't really make the M1s work, but the sniper we had before the M1 is the sniper that we will continue to use through the war, trying and not really being able to replace it with the M1C. So um, in 1942 the SVT basically is cut from production, or not, not cut, but dramatically reduced in production, because it is expensive, it is too expensive, and is basically deemed not a cost-effective option for the Red Army. Now a lot of this we can explain from the massive growth in the Red Army, the huge number of soldiers that they needed to equip, as well as the industrial conditions at the time. The Soviet Union did not have the industrial base of experience that the United States did, during this same time period, uh, there are really huge quality control issues involved in production of the SVT. The, the reject rates are places that we would consider astronomical by American manufacturing standards, and they're overcome simply by throwing more material and time and determination into the production process. And eventually it's just not cost effective. They've, they decide to go back to producing most of the guns and submachine guns. Um, in 1942 the SVT is simultaneously replaced in production by the AVT. They decide we're just going to go with the full auto version of this instead. That's sort of the kind of thing that the US doesn't do. We have the BAR, we don't need to manufacture a full auto version 
of the M1 as sort of an ad hoc light machine gun. The Soviets don't have adequate production in their mind of the, the Degturev light machine guns, and they do try to try to push the SVT into service as a, a substitute standard light machine gun, which does not work very well. So total production uh, between the 38s and the 40s for the Soviet Union is about two and a half million guns. This is a very legitimate, respectable production of these rifles. Uh, and they're pulled out of service, or they're replaced in service, they're substituted. Not so much because of any fundamental problem with the rifle, it is a pretty good rifle, but because priorities shift and the economic conditions make it difficult to equip every soldier with an SVT. In a way that the US, not having to deal with bombing, not having to deal with any sort of occupation of American soil, Frankly, we kind of had an easy an easy path through a lot of the industrial elements aspects of the Second World War. Like, no one ever came in and bombed the Winchester factory. We never had to relocate Harrington and Richardson, you know, across to the West Coast. We didn't have those issues. Um, made it easier for us to have reliable, predictable standard, you know, very efficient production. Now, Germany is where the self-loading rifle thing really kind of falls apart in World War II. They're probably, I think a lot of people think about the, the German self-loading rifles more so than the Russian ones, despite the fact that Ger the Russians made four times as many of these things as the Germans did. The German attitude before the war towards self-loading rifles was much different than that of the United States or the Soviet Union. And that was, it wasn't seen as necessarily a bad thing, but they were kind of dubious about the concept. There was an idea that uh, a self-loading rifle was going to be very difficult to actually produce. Like, is it really going to work mechanically? Mauser had been trying to make a successful self-loading rifle way back into World War I. They never pulled it off. Um, you see this in some of the original specifications for what would become the Gewehr 41 in German service. Things like, you can't drill a gas port in the barrel. Like, well, we don't think that's going to work. Turns out that works just fine. That's the way it's virtually always done now. Um, the gun has to be able to work just like a bolt-action Mauser Car 98K in case it stops functioning in semi-auto. And so you'll see the, the Mauser G41 has a big pseudo-bolt handle at the back of the receiver so that you can lift it up and pull it back and push it forward and crank it down. And it'll work just like you had a, a bolt-action rifle, because we don't really trust that this thing's actually going to function all the time. Simultaneously, the German army is focused much more on its emplaced machine guns than it is on the individual infantrymen. The concept is that the, mil the infantry firepower is based on the machine guns. Originally the MG34, this would become the MG42 when it enters service as well. And the role of the squad around the gun is not to really have firepower. Their role is to supply the, gun the machine gun with ammunition and to protect it. And Let's be fair, Germany has to deal with resource allocation during the 1930s when it's rebuilding its military, and they can't have the newest, best, most expensive of everything. And one of the areas of weaponry development that gets the short straw is infantry armaments. So they have a good... the MG34 is a great machine gun for World War II. Um, it is basically the beginning, functionally the beginning, of the universal general purpose machine gun concept. And in order to do that, and have aircraft, and have tanks, and have everything else that Germany had to rebuild from not quite scratch, but close, something's got to give, and self-loading self rifles were the thing that gave. Now, companies were experimenting with self-loading rifle development during the 1930s. Eventually, German troops would run into SVT-38s and then SVT-40s in Russia, and like, the troops really liked them. Um, there, I mean, there are even dispatches from guys like Himmler specifically telling units that, like, you guys, every unit should have a scoped Russian self-loading rifle, because it was a better option than what was available to the German infantry for specific purposes. It's funny that the Soviets would abandon the sniper version of the SVT-40 kind of at the same time that the Germans are jumping at the chance to have them. Uh, different, different priorities, different uh, expectations of quality and effectiveness, I suppose. At any rate, um, Germany would basically just be in the field, beginning of field testing of their self-loading rifles, the Gewehr 41s, in 1943. At the same time that the Soviets have already basically stopped making the standard SVT-40, there had been 
something close to 2 million of these in the field produced already. The US has fully equipped everybody in the military, essentially, whose job was infantry, with an M1 Garand. And only at that point is Germany, they have like 65, 6600, the first batches of the Gewehr 41s ready for field testing in early 1943. They're behind the curve. Um, now that field testing would eventually reveal that the Gewehr 41s are both Mauser and Walther versions are kind of craptastic guns. They're not very good. They really need to be improved. And Germany takes the gas system from their captured Soviet rifles. They stick it on the Walther Gewehr 41. That becomes the Gewehr 43. That's finally put into production. But it's not until 1944 that they really have this thing in full-scale production. By full-scale I mean we're talking around a thousand rifles per day being produced. But even that leads to less than half a million, about 460,000 of these uh, Gewehr 43s manufactured during the war, which is a tiny, you know, it's barely more than a tenth of what the US produced in M1s. To, com to compound this fact, this problem, Germany has this sort of schizophrenic plan of always reconsidering, where the US takes the M1, adopts it, and just sticks with it. Germany will go from the Gewehr 41s, then to the Gewehr 43, and then right as the Gewehr 43 is spooling up into production, it's like, ooh, squirrel, and they go to Sturmgewehrs in the intermediate 8x33 cartridge. Now, I'm not saying that wasn't a better technological product, but, and I think it was, like, they, what would have been better for them if they had gone straight to the Sturmgewehr at the very beginning of the war, but of course they didn't. Uh, the problem, though, is by constantly changing production models, you're not able to build up basically a, in an, a, uh, an organizational experience manufacturing the guns. They're building these guns at a multiplicity of different factories. Nobody's really building them all that long in comparison to what the US is doing. And so the cost efficiency is never all that good. They have fewer quality control problems than the Russians do because they have better industrial experience, but at the same time they're suffering from uh, encroaching foreign armies on their territory, they're suffering from significant aerial bombardment, strategic bombing. Um, in some factories they're actually suffering from worker sabotage. They're using slave labor in some of the G43 production, and that results in deliberately sabotaged rifles, things like there is never deliberate sabotage of M1 Garand production anywhere. This is another area where the US kind of had, had the industrial side of the war on easy mode. Russia and Germany both had harder situations to contend with. But the Germans, I think, make it harder on themselves by never just picking a thing and sticking to it. Uh, and I think we see this, I mean it seems, I'm not a tank expert to me, we see this in their tank development as well, but it's always the new thing. Always the new thing. Instead of, to a certain extent, they do take Panzer threes and fours and focus on them, but they're still diverting massive amounts of resources into new secret super weapon development of heavier tanks. Um, and we see it in the small arms, newer, better, wonder weapon small arms. Because after the, I mean, the Sturmgewehr 40, 44 is in production and the war's not over yet, and they're already working on the next thing. The Sturmgewehr 45 was going to be essentially a roller-locked or roller-delayed blowback gun, mechanically very different from the Sturmgewehr 44. Like if the war had lasted another year, they would have done it again. They would have abandoned yet another rifle and switched focus to something newer and better. And it is better, but there's also, as the Russians said, as I think Stalin said, uh, quantity has a quality all of its own. And consistency and stability is something that is not fully appreciated in the German small arms regime. So these are organized here in order of production quantity, with the US at the top, the Soviets in the middle, the Germans at the bottom. To my mind, maybe this is going to be a little, uh, uh, little controversial, but I'll say they're also rated in uh, quality terms. To me, the M1 is the best product of these three rifles. If you have to pick one of these rifles to go into World War II with, I don't see any reason that you would not choose the M1. Um, it's a well-balanced design, it's a very reliable design. Both the, both the Russian and German rifles suffer from reliability issues in the field. Um, the Russians are complaining about it, the Germans are complaining about their Gewehr 41 so much that they're trying to get Russian uh, SVTs. Um, you know, it's... the M1 is to me a fairly obvious leader in this pack. Then between the, the Gewehr 43 and the SVT 40, 
I really think the SVT is the better of the two rifles. Um, to my mind, it's a more efficient design. It's a gun that was put together and worked. They got the kinks out of it better than the G43s. The SVT-40 was the result of a longer and better development cycle. The G43 was still a pretty rushed gun. Um, it is a more fragile gun internally. Uh, it is shorter, but I don't know that it's actually any better balanced with its weight distribution. And given the choice, I would take an SVT-40 over a G43 if I was going into World War II. Well, this has been a bit long and rambly, but you're still here, so it appears that you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more of this sort of sort of higher level discussion comparison, let me know down in the comments. It's kind of fun to do these, although they don't focus on the specific historical details of any particular gun. Anyway, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.